Um, okay, uh, so I'll, I'll probably talk fairly quickly, um, but I, the, the basic idea of what I want to talk about today is sort of the work that we're currently doing at um, the Connected Intelligence Centre around using uh, XAPI data to build learning analytics sort of ecosystems. Um, and a concept that's come up around sort of pragmatic data interoperability um, mm -hmm. that I'm starting to sort of work through. Um, Jonathan, I can talk about where we're up to with the um, profiles because a lot of this will feed in quite a bit um, down the track. Um, but what, what I'm kind of trying to move towards is a carrot that actually encourages broader scale take up of profiles. Um, because as was mentioned, it's nice to see them actually being used in the wild. <laughs> and I, I think um, we, we need to give people more reasons to actually um, follow these profiles. So I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but basically what KIC is, is sort of a, almost an innovation lab at uh, the University of Technology in Sydney. So what we do is we specialise in learning analytics, but we um, sort of, a lot of our research is almost inward focusing. So we're trying to actually help the university to use data and analytics more effectively. And so we do a lot of work internally as well as doing our research, um, just generally in terms of how you can use learning analytics as mainly in a higher education context, although some of that then moves into sort of schooling sector and professional learning. Um, so it's quite a, a different sort of structure. So normally learning analytics labs are either hosted in a faculty um, in a university context or they're hosted in a central unit. Um, we're kind of a central unit that's got a, a bunch of academics in it. So it's sort of a mix of the two models, which can lead to sort of um, more interesting research results um, with a bit more rigor than some of the things I've seen coming out of central units over the years. Um, but yeah, there's a, another, um, you know, another case of you know, this kind of structure would be Michigan's Innovation Lab. Um, and so Tim McKay and Simon buckingham Shum have written a paper about the two models across the two universities, um, which you could read in Educause um, lately. Um, but basically, um, UTS has a new grand plan, a new institutional plan that just got launched yesterday morning for us, in fact. And um, two of the major themes around that are sort of lifetime learning and personalization. And I think what you'd see if you looked at almost any university strategic plan at the moment is most of them are actually moving towards this sort of idea, at least in Australia. Um, there's, there's a lot of aggressive marketing towards personalising the student experience. But uh, what we mean by personalisation is quite often very um, sort of incremental. So, you know, personalisation in an adaptive learning system where someone sits in one environment and kind of gets guided through a series of steps is not really something that prepares people for a lifetime of learning. Um, to do that, we need to be off out in the wild and learning across multiple spaces and places because that's basically where we're going to be doing a lot of our learning anyway um, in a lifetime. And so we're, we're thinking very wide around what we mean by personalization as an institution. So there's a lot of opportunities um, internally at the moment to develop things and to build new systems that will actually help to achieve this vision. Um, which surprisingly to me is actually publicly available. Half the time UTS puts things behind a firewall. So um, if anyone's interested in seeing more about that, you can have a look there. But most of my work is really thinking about, well, where does learning happen? And we, we know that learning happens everywhere. Um, so, you know, traditionally we've had people kind of assuming that the learning analytics they provide will, um, you know, be gathered from one system, uh, maybe a learning management system, maybe an ebook reader, something like that. And then that system is providing learning analytics um, for people. Um, educators quite often rather than students. Uh, a strong focus at KIC is around student facing analytics. Um, and so that, that opens up new challenges. But really, we, we know that learning happens everywhere across lots of different spaces. And so a, an ongoing interest for me has always been about how we can actually pull that data together, um, which brings us into problems with interoperability um, right from the beginning. So 
um, one of my early kind of bits of work that I was doing quite a long time ago was around the Connected Learning Analytics Toolkit. And basically what that, um, what that tool does is it, and we've actually got a new version that's um, currently being rebuilt where we're refactoring the whole code base. Um, but basically what this tool does is it interfaces with social media APIs, um, stores the data in a learning record store, but with a very strong um, focus on recipes and profiles um, to try and make sure that we're ha we've harmonised everything because I'm very lazy and I don't like building learning analytics again and again for multiple data sources. Um, so then if we pay very careful attention to um, the semantics of the data at the outset, we, we find it's much easier to do our analytics and then we can send the data off to various sort of dashboards or reports or um, different things depending on what, we, what we're interested in doing at the time. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, there's papers you can read on that. Um, what I want to talk about is the new work we've been doing this year around scaling that up. Uh, for a learning ecosystem, and so that come you know that brings me back to that concept of well, learning happens over a lifetime. We we need to be caring about learning um, data coming from multiple bases and places, um, and different universities or different sectors are using different types of uh, learning data, especially when it comes to activity data. So if we think about it, at the moment we've got. Um, Caliper probably would be the dominant player in the higher education sector, I'd say, at the moment, because of the emphasis upon learning management systems, large scale um, sort of data providers in the consortium. And professional learning environments are tending to use sort of XAPI. So once people hit the workforce, a lot of these sort of, um, you know, learning training platforms are using XAPI. And the other thing we're finding is a lot of the um, smaller scale um, data providers are using XAPI as well because you don't have to join IMS so you can actually start generating XAPI statements very quickly. Mm -hmm. So across that lifetime of learning, um, there's a lot of different people starting to provide data, but um, even if they're using Cal well, even if they're using XAPI, there's no guarantee that you'll get interoperability. Um, a lot of people aren't following the profiles that do exist and not enough profiles exist. So this is, this is a real problem for me at the moment because I'm having to interface with a lot of these different vendors and deal with their cruddy learning data that doesn't actually help me really at all um, and then perform a lot of other mappings. Um, so if we think about the kind of digital learning ecosystem that UTS is trying to create at the moment, um, the basic idea is there's a core LMS, which we're, uh, is going to be Canvas in our case. So we're sort of in the process of transitioning between Blackboard and Canvas. Um, we've got a core sort of set of tools which are heavily supported by um, our IT division. And then there's sort of an acceptance that will actually academics are going to use a whole heap of other tools, whatever you do. Um, so then there's a question of, well, how do you support that? Um, and can you build learning analytics over it? Or can you at least try to get a more complete sort of learning analytics picture? Um, and then, you know, on top of that, we're trying to think about personalization and we're trying to think about personalization over all of these systems, which then means we need to be harmonizing our learning data. Um, but again, you know, there's a lot of different tools that can be coming into that. So at the moment, you know, there's a number of interactives that are being used um, to sort of Im improve the sort of learner experience. Um, we've got a bunch of academics and different student cohorts who are using a whole heap of social media tools. Um, so that this ecosystem is going to get quite complicated. Uh, I think they did an audit this year um, as they were starting to plan the new transition to Canvas and they found that well over 100 tools were being used at UTS, some formally, some informally. And I would not think that that's particularly unusual in the like, general environment. I'd say most universities you'd be finding that. So data interoperability is really essential to us. Um, and it's something that I've been obsessing about for a long time. If anyone um, knows the work that I've done in the XAPI community, 
But there's sort of a question that's emerging in my head about, well, what type of interoperability and what do we mean by interoperability anyway? And so there's kind of two narratives that you'll see about this in the community. And I'm kind of calling it the big and comprehensive or the loose and modular model. And you could sort of see um, the caliper model is the big and comprehensive model. So, you know, the idea is that all ed tech will use one sort of data stack. You're all going to use caliper and, um, you know, that's it. So if, if, if the whole, you know, ed tech community gets on board with that, then my life is a lot easier and that's great because my life is very complicated when I'm trying to get all the data from all these different systems, mm. but basically it doesn't happen, you know? So the, the big and modular or the big and comprehensive sort of model, we've been dreaming about that for a very long time. Um, and, you know, basically people don't follow it. So learning analytics, which is a field which could most benefit from data interoperability, very rarely actually follows standards. Um, most of the lead researchers are doing whatever they want. Um, you know, they'll just generate a data set um, in whatever is most convenient for the analytical techniques they want to apply which is fair enough um, for a sort of research project or for you know, your particular environment. But when we start trying to scale, um, things get more complicated. And if we try to scale over a lifetime, um, or we start thinking about things like personal data stores for learners, or thinking about um, how we might personalize their learning journey over a lifetime, then we very quickly run into problems if people aren't adhering to these standards. Um, so the XAPI model is a bit more um, modular and a bit more easy to get up and running with, but we have already got this problem where not all XAPI data is actually interoperable. And, and you see that very quickly um, with our ecosystem. So um, we're using Articulate, H5P, Atomic Search, a whole heap of different things. Um, and we've already got, you know, the Learnosity XAPI data is not the same as the Articulate XAPI data. So, you know, just just because you put into your um, into your sort of calls for well re requests for information or your tender processes, just because you say that you know you must emit XAPI data, doesn't mean that um, you're going to get the same XAPI data. So this is something I've been worrying about quite a bit. And until people actually start really taking profiles seriously, um, that problem's not going away. Um, so at the moment, we've been doing a lot of work this year about getting data out of Canvas. Um, and, you know, we've gone through and we've been pulling data by um, multiple hits of the live API in Canvas, and we've got data into the LRS. And it looks like that. So if I'm pulling off data out of discussion forums in Canvas, then, you know, we'll get, you know, a bunch of statements. And really, this is an extension of the connected learning um, recipe, which is where we're in the process of turning into a profile. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if we follow that profile and, you know, we've got the data coming from multiple environments, then we can start getting some stuff out of different learning record stores around class activity or what kind of, you know, activities are actors doing in the class or what resources are being used in my class. Um, and, you know, actually, we've put a lot of work into harmonising um, a few of the things that I can't get out of Canvas as an instructor very easily. So Canvas has appalling analytics when it comes to things like discussion forums and um, quizzes, for example. So non-compulsory um, items, it, it doesn't actually give me any reporting I can use as an instructor. And instructors often want to know if people are actually doing the you know things that they're setting up. Uh, and so really what I've been doing this year is going through and just prioritizing the stuff that I'm most interested in seeing as an instructor in the hope that we can actually then move that out to the whole um, UTS ecosystem. Um, but, you know, back to what I was saying before, as we start uh, integrating the data coming from all these different sort of interactive tools that we're starting to embed into the core um, learning ecosystem, we've got a problem where the statements they're generating aren't actually the same. And so we need to start thinking about the mappings that we can make use of so that we can, we, we can then build up the same analytics over all of those different uh, things used in the ecosystem. 
Um, and the thing is, even if uh, all of that was working for the you know current environment that we've built, um, it's almost inevitable that there'll be some other new tool that uh, learning designers really want to integrate or there'll be some new data source that somebody needs or, you know, some other learning analytics tool comes along. So the whole, the whole way along the journey we've been going on, um, there's this problem that even if we require the, the current set of supported tools to be, you know, very tightly controlled, very quickly the thing kind of explodes. And, you know, if we want to provide a really rich learning experience or we want to really support our educators, then we need to really worry about how we can make it easy to integrate new, new functionality as it becomes appropriate. And so this is where the whole pragmatic data interoperability thing comes from. Um, I'm working from the assumption that it doesn't really matter, um, like the, the, the sort of cat is kind of out of the bag like so we we can't we can't expect caliper to be um, a big and comprehensive model over all the learning data i'll encounter and so we need to provide more reasons to actually behave well and you know essentially encourage vendors towards producing data in either very well defined x api profiles so proper best practice profiles or you know, following Caliper when they're emitting data because the learning analytics community is really suffering from this lack of data interoperability at the moment. And so we've been really kind of starting to think about, well, how can we actually provide um, incentives to actually do that? Um, and so what we've been building is essentially an extract transform load pipeline where what we're doing is we're pulling data that's activity data, um, that's XAPI basically, all into a learning record store, extracting it through to a um, like NoSQL database, and then building a GraphQL uh, interface over the top of that. And what that gives us is a way of actually um, promising to data consumers, so different learning analytics applications, that the data will always look the same because what we have is a, an interface for the consumers that's set up by the queries in the GraphQL interface. Um, and we can map via the resolvers in the GraphQL sort of set up back to whatever the data source um, that we're most interested in using is. So Canvas, for example, um, is moving towards full implementation of Caliper by the end of this year. So um, it will be quite easy to get data out of um, Canvas using that kind of setup. But um, I, my understanding of it from what I've seen so far is that, for example, doesn't include the actual text in a discussion forum. And that's very important to us at UTS because we do a lot of text analytics. And so there's, there's missing data, even if you've got a full um, compliance with specification. So what we're sort of thinking is um, different resolvers can point to Canvas uh, in terms of getting the bulk of the data from um, the Caliper sort of SQS server um, with sort of additional data being added via hits for the, the Canvas API. Um, and then if we're doing a lot of uh, careful thinking about the learning record providers from these other smaller um, like data sort of provisioning tools, then what we can start doing is writing into our tenders that these, these tools need to actually um, adhere to published profiles um, or uh, the, the, the vendors will actually need to perform mappings between um, their tools and a set of profiles that we, you know, require them to adhere to. Um, so what this gives us is um, a way of minimising the work we need to do as an institution um, and then giving us data that we can actually make sense of and actually do nice analytics with. Um, and then over here on the left, um, we can start via the queries that we set up in the GraphQL um, interface, we can start essentially building up a, a, an ecosystem of learning analytics tools. So we've got some uh, prototype sort of user configurable dashboards that we're building. Um, OnTask is a, another um, tool that's come out of another Australian project, which allows you to send personalized messages to students based on their activity traces. 
So normally what happens with OnTask is it's directly interfaced with a um, learning management system. And what that means is you actually only get um, a tiny subset of all of the types of interactions a student might be making in our e ecosystem. So if we were going to interface uh, on task with Canvas in our case, we'd be missing all of the things that students might be doing in, um, you know, Articulate Storyline or various sort of Slack channels that are relevant to the subject or, you know, other, other important things. And so what we can do if we harmonize everything behind a GraphQL interface is we can essentially let on task interface with that GraphQL, um, which then means that we're collecting, we're able to essentially use any of the activities that students are performing that are supported by the ecosystem in personalizing these messages based on um, sort of if then rules basically is what on task uses. And so then, you know, we've got other tools around um, writing analytics. So for example, Kix developed a ACA writer tool, which um, helps students get feedback on academic writing that they produce anytime, anywhere. Um, so fully automated feedback. It's not used as a marking tool at all, but it, it helps support students in um, sort of thinking about where they might not have um, done as well as they want in their writing before they submit their assignments. So this, this is built. Um, we, we have basically the prototype up and running now, um, and we're basically just adding functionality as we go. Um, and I've just been given permission to open source the whole um, code base, which is very nice because the model I'm starting to kind of move towards and hopefully get some take up at least across the Australian learning analytics community, but potentially everywhere would be that um, if, if this ETL pipeline is kind of used and we've got a nice open source repository or a series of repositories that anyone can commit, uh, contribute to, mm -hmm. then what people could do if they've got a new tool that they need to use is they can just add a new learning record provider to this thing um, mm -hmm. and basically set the resolvers in the GraphQL. And then all of the queries that are relevant to that kind of data source get run for free. So if there's new queries that people need to run, so let's say they want to interface a new tool in, then people can design new queries over here. And so what this gives us as a learning analytics community is sort of a higher layer way of um, uni uniting all of our data sources into sort of one sensible format that is sort of agnostic about where the data came from originally. So what this lets us do is um, use both Caliper and XAPI and potentially poorly designed XAPI because what we need to do then is just do a little bit of um, sort of plumbing in the, in the back end to actually transform the data from a, you know, strange type into like, you know, one that's accepted or supported by the, the current API. So this is sort of, I'm, I'm calling this the learning analytics API. Um, and the, the hope would be that we get broad take up across the learning analytics community because that makes it easier for vendors to emit statements because we know what the learning analytics community is expecting. Um, and it also makes it easier for the learning analytics community because we can essentially assume that anything that meets, um, or anything that's actually in implementing best practice in terms of standards, we'll just work out of the box. So the data is already essentially um, interoperable as long as you've pulled the data into the system. Um, so this is, this is my current thing that I'm trying to convince everyone is a, a good idea. Um, and we, we think it's got legs. Um, we're just at the point of starting to share it and see what other people think as well. So I'm very happy to get as much feedback as I can from this or, you know, people are welcome to send me an email or something if they want to see more. Um, so we haven't actually open sourced the repos yet, but um, mm -hmm. we're just working out what licenses we, we want to use. It'll probably be M MIT or, um, uh, or uh, Apache. Um, we're just going through that sort of what precisely do we want to use for, for this particular um, set of um, set of tools. Um, okay, so let me just explain how this GraphQL scheme is working quickly. But, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff about this on the web. So GraphQL is basically a, um, sort of a, 
a supposed rela uh, replacement of RESTful APIs. I, I think both are going to very happily exist into the future and they, they need to both exist. But what, what it gives us that's really useful in the learning analytics community is very flexible ways of accessing data. So, you know, what if I want for some data source um, to just count activity, I can, you know, essentially use a, a query which is quite straightforward where I look at, you know, sort of, um, where where did the you know where did the notes so in this case the short text messages come from when were they created and I could maybe send that off to a dashboard that has a you know an activity line or what if I want to do text analysis I can ask for more information from the um, from the data source which uh, includes things like who created it and what text was used so what what it lets you do is sort of run very flexible sort of access to data. Um, and basically get as get the right data for the particular anal analytics tool you're using at the time. So this is being used a lot. Uh, Facebook developed it. It's being used by GitHub, um, you know, a number of other large uh, sort of tech companies now because what it lets them do is kind of keep promises to front-end developers while changing things in the back end. And this is something that's likely to happen an awful lot in the learning analytics community. Um, so basically what's happening is there's a schema that's being defined by us around what's important in um, our sort of learning analytics ecosystem and that schema is sort of extensible. So when I'm running the get notes query, I can run it on any of these, these things, for example. Um, and so I can get just the data I need for the tool that I'm trying to send it to. Um, and then what happens is you've got these resolvers that are fetching data from the back end and basically they're just fetching it from the appropriate place according to where the data came from. So for example, here's, here's um, essentially a GraphQL playground where I'm running different queries um, depending on what information I want to get. So I'm searching over all notes for um, notes that were created by me. And what you'll see here is the, the subject that the, the thing appeared in and the um, time at which it appeared. So there's, there's just a simple activity kind of query. What if I want to get the text that I wrote as well, then I um, add some extra terms to my search notes command and I get back some more, more details. And for example, I'll get the text as well, which I can then use in um, text analytics. Or maybe I want to send data to one task, then I use a different query and I'll get back a list of all the emails um, that are relevant and um, the, the counts of their activity. So that's just a pilot um, integration we're just setting up now. Um, but that will be very useful across the Australian learning analytics community in particular, because a lot of us are starting to use that tool. Um, so summary, um, the, the basic idea that we're going for is a usable solution. Um, to instead of a you know idealistic solution of thou shalt use caliper or thou shalt use you know something else, um, we're just we're trying to come up with something that people will actually use that's easy to use that makes it easier for um, people building learning analytics solutions to actually um, uh, get data that is useful to them out of the box and to then extend um, data sources as well as um, tools as appropriate. And the, the idea is then that gives us a really flexible and extensible way of moving data. And it encourages best practice use of Caliper and XAPI profiles. So I see a lot of vendors in the XAPI community not actually adhering to profiles themselves. And I want to try and force them towards actually doing what I need them to do, which is to give me data that's interoperable across multiple environments. So it shouldn't be a competitive advantage to emit data that doesn't actually um, work interoperably across multiple environments. And L LRS vendors have exactly the same sort of obligations. So I wanna see more of that um, building into the XAPI ecosystem. But, you know, admitting, uh, accepting that everyone's still going to wanna to use their own favorite kind of tools, we need ways of actually making that easy and helping people to do the right thing. So, so that's where we've gotten to so far. And if anyone wants to sort of find out more, then feel free to send me an email or ask questions now. Wow. I guess um, some of you might have questions. 
I'll jump in for a minute. Hey, hey Kirstie, it's nice to nice to hear you again. Thanks for getting up early. Uh, oh, it's there. almost light now. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> um, it, it's great. I mean, it's you, you've clearly made a lot of progress since you and I last talked, which is awesome. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying to get my hands on this and play with it myself a little bit. Um, I, I, I guess one of my first questions, or I'll just throw one question out there and let other people talk, is I'm curious a little bit about canvas and how you see working with them um you had mentioned you know and i've seen this a lot myself a lot of people say they they follow x api and they and they do in regards to spec structure uh, but don't use any profiles is your understanding that canvas is going to be using profiles from uh, that have been defined by the caliper you know paved pay to play community or are you gonna or are you just expecting them to be caliper structured data coming out uh so Basically, I was at eLearning Career a couple of months ago and Marcus Grelling, who's sort of the IMS representative in Europe, he's sort of their data architect, I think it was. He was saying that um, they're going to fully implement Caliper by the end of this year. Um, the SQS setup that they've got, so there's essentially a data pipeline that you can interface with, with our um, Canvas instance at the moment that appears to be emitting Caliper statements. And we're just starting to explore that now. So we've mainly been hitting their API and then generating our own XAPI statements because their XAPI stuff is useless. Um, but that's really complicated. Like it's a long and very <laughs> unpleasant yeah, yeah. process. And you run into a whole heap of problems with rate limitations and other stuff like that. So it's, it's nasty. So I think the, the optimal solution for us is going to be use Caliper for as much of the activity data as um, it just generates natively out of the box mm -hmm. and enhance, like, so the data that doesn't come through on Caliper, we can enhance with the like, ex specific hits of the API. And then basically the GraphQL won't care which, which format it came from. It'll just map back to um, the underlying data source that's relevant for the queries you're trying to run. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, there's there's a lot of there, there's pieces of tech in there that I'm not experienced with. I haven't used GraphQL, so I'll have to get into that a little more too and learn what it's capable of. But yeah, I, we're I could, just learning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could certainly say at the very least that the video profile group, speaking on behalf of Pankaj and, and, and anybody else who sort of joins the video profile, is that uh, I think we'd be happy to add the visualizations that we have done for um, visualizing video profile compliant data to Graph. QL when we can figure out how to do that. Um, so we can try to reconnect on that at some point, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, so like what I want to do now that we've got that basic proof of concept up and running is start trying to implement some of these profiles and video profile is one of the top ones of the list because I know that academics are going to want that. They're going to want to see how people are watching their videos. For sure. Um, for sure. And we actually have, uh, oh, I can't even remember what the tool is. It's some weird tool I've never used before, um, which does actually natively emit XAPI, but I suspect they're not going to be using the video profile. So that's a thing for me to check on the list. But yeah, the more of this kind of collaboration we get across the different communities, um, the more powerful this kind of approach will become. So it really relies on yeah, sort of people stepping up and doing that. So that'd be awesome. Yeah, I don't think the video profile is, is too away from too far away from getting adoption from larger tools. I mean, we 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 pushed a huge um, branch over to um, a pull request to uh, H5P to get them to be video profile compliant. And then I know we we, we made a version of video JS that admits video profile compliant XAPI statements, but I think it has to somebody has to go back and make it into a plugin for the script. But uh, yeah. anyways, either way. Uh, there's there's progress there that I think would be amazing to put into into this this project you're doing. Yeah, cool. That would be really useful. Yeah, so we should definitely have a chat um, like at another time, and see where everything's up to with that. Yeah. For the this is a this is Patrick for the video profile. I think really in particular the hotspot uh, information uh, visualization is is really valuable lets you yeah. kind of look at a glance, you know, what, what areas are the, you know, most viewed areas. Yeah. Um, yep. Academics definitely love that. <laughs> they love, they love pretty pictures as we, as we all do. Um, uh, I had a, I had a quick question in, in your connected learning analytics toolkit 
uh, slide, you talked about uh, scraping social media into an XAPI uh, LRS. Yep. What um, how, what are you what are you capturing and and why and and maybe how I guess or yep. or why really? So so why is because basically most of the really innovative lecturers we have um, both at my old university, Queensland University of Technology, and at UTS. Um, they use social media, they use weird things. So for example, I've had people who've been using a WordPress instance because they hate the institutional LMS. And then running, for example, weekly Twitter chats is a classic sort of scenario you see quite often because basically, you know, a lot of the library and information science people are trying to set up a professional portfolio for their students. And so the, mm. the quicker they get the students online and, you know, interfacing in the wild, the, the better it is for the students in the long run. Um, I've got, I teach a statistical thinking for data science subject, which is, uh, most of it's driven by a um, like big project that students have to do. So my students are using Slack to talk to each other, Trello to manage projects. Some of the brave ones are starting to use GitHub. Um, we've got assignments that go into a WordPress instance and we've got activity on Canvas. So, um, you know, it, it becomes, if you're trying to construct authentic learning scenarios, it becomes very, you know, apparent very quickly that um, students are going to be using these other social media um, to communicate and do things. Um, and so basically what we do is we um, hit the APIs of any of the tools that, you know, work. So we used to be able to, for example, use Facebook, but as their APIs have shut down, that's just not really possible anymore. Um, version two of the CLA toolkit currently integrates Trello and Slack. We're integrating GitHub soon and we're looking at setting that up as a um, sort of a really nice test case in my class for next semester. So basically we're prioritizing my data sources, um, WordPress, mm. Twitter, things like that. Um, it basically just pulls the data in and emits a, a XAPI statement via a learning record provider that runs off of that connected learning profile. And in the and then in the statement itself, are you actually pulling the the content of the social media post or just the metadata about it, like someone did post? No, uh, we pull like the content. Yeah, so so we um, because we do a lot of text analytics, um, we yeah. always store the actual text that was posted. Um, oh and yeah. Do other stuff with that as well. Um, and then are you creating uh, an X separate XAPI statement for each post and reply, or is it like just one big blob or how does that work? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a separate statement for every like mm -hmm. event that occurs. Yeah. So it's sort um, of, Oh, you go. Sorry. Uh, no, no, go ahead. Uh, it was just, it was very, very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so basically what we do is um, and we're, we're doing the same thing with the Canvas one. We emit a statement um, for each action that occurs. So, you know, if a student posts to Canvas, then that constitutes a statement. If they reply in Canvas, then that also constitutes a statement. So we've, we've got um, data coming into our learning record store at the moment from both um, Trello and Twitter as well as from Canvas, but we need to do just a piece of work to map those statements. So we're, we're just starting to align them to make sure that they're semantically the same. And then basically we'll be able to just run any analytics over it out of the box. Um, but yeah, like a lot of that careful work at the beginning makes your life a lot easier later <laughs> is the big lesson I've learned with XAPI. And, and I was looking at a, a machine learning, um, I guess library called fast text to do categorization of that text. So I'm wondering, you know, if you already have the full text as part of the XAPI statement, you could then categorize it and then, I guess, give people credit for the whatever category that text is uh, just happens to be reflected, right? Is that your thoughts too? Yeah, so we don't normally use um, automated methods for grading just because there's problems with precision and stuff. So quite often you can end up, for example, with... A really so so let's say you've got a student who has to write a reflective text, for example, um, a, a really very reflective kind of well-written piece of work, 
um, can get very poorly graded by automatic methods. It's the same with, you know, exam kind of, well, you know, college entry essays and things like that. There's, there's always these issues around being sure that the machine learning is doing, you know, exactly what it's meant to be doing. Um, and so what we normally do is we use text analytics as a formative tool to give feedback to students. Um, so for example, um, in the case of discussion forums, there's a community of inquiry um, sort of cognitive presence detector that we worked on a number of years ago. And so that basically classifies posts according to the cognitive presence construct. So it sort of classifies them as triggering, exploring, integrating, resolving kind of posts. Um, and what you can then do is you can sort of feed that information back to students to sort of show them how they're participating. But, you know, there's a real problem with a lot of that stuff because that's supervised machine learning and, you know, the data set that that was collected over was sort of quite a, um, you know, it was one data set from one university. And what you find is the classifier doesn't actually extend to other contexts very well. So there's a, a real piece of work around generating more robust methods um, or finding new pedagogical ways of incorporating that stuff. So the the designing for student facing learning analytics paper that I referred to in one of the earlier slides has some sort of information about how we deal with that. Um, but yeah, it's like, we're, we're a bit cautious about using um, text analytics for grading, but what we do find is giving students access to feedback whenever they're writing is really, really useful. So um, we, we develop tools around that kind of formative feedback process, which helps them think about what they're writing and to write more effectively for their summative items. And the, the caveat I'd give with wh where we're up to is it's um, very much a pilot <laughs> pipeline. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of, um, you know, like we've got a proof of concept of the whole pipeline now, but there's a huge piece of work around extending it and, um, you know, integrating new data sources and then tying to new analytics products. So, it, I mean, for, for some, an approach like this to work, it would have to be um, very much sort of supported by everyone in the community or by a large number of people, because otherwise it's, you know, like basically what will happen is at UTS we'll keep doing this because we think it's going to work. Um, but I, I think it would be more exciting if, um, a, you know, a number of different universities were using it. So we're just starting to go and propose that this is a good way to move forward in Australia. But, you know, we'll see if we can get wider take up. Yeah. So theoretically, it can work with different profiles. Yeah, so that's the hope. Like, and one of the, I was chatting to, um, I was chatting to Jason and um, like some of the other Veracity folk. Mm -hmm. There's there's a, a an extension to the XAPI wrapper that ought to be possible, um, and I'm kind of sad it doesn't exist yet. But they, I think they might end up writing it, where basically if you gave um, sort of some data and a profile to the XAPI wrapper, it should be able to generate statements in the correct format, and that's another good carrot to encourage wider take up profiles. Um, so I think what we need to be doing as a community is making it easy for people to do the right thing. Whereas at the moment, it's, it's very hard to actually even an existing profile. It's not that straightforward to actually be sure that your, um, your LRP is actually generating XAPI statements that actually follow the profile. Like, you know, it's basically done by hand is, you know, well, that's how we do it. I don't know if anyone else has found a better way. Yeah, we, we do it by hand. I was kind of hoping the this profile server, whatever was to come of that, would, would provide support in that area. But I, yeah. I don't know what the status of that is. <laughs> yeah, I think they're still gathering requirements and stuff about it. But that's, you know, like just a simple, like there's basically a slight extension to the wrapper that I think would do it fairly well out of the box. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, getting that working across all use cases is potentially going to be tricky. Mm -hmm. But we, we could make it a lot easier, yeah. I, I was uh, working with the the social uh, networking social social networking COP at one point, 
and mm-hmm. IBM was part of that, and they uh, were working on a translation engine. I, I don't think they ever finished it, um, but I think they have a proof of concept out there where uh, basically it just it maps verbs from one system to a different system. So it sounds like maybe similar to the, the issue that you're running into. Yeah, that sounds very useful. Do you know if they open source that? Like, if I go looking, I might have a look. I, I don't. I don't believe they give away anything away for free anymore. <laughs> but um, but uh, if you're interested, I can put you in in contact with the right person, the developer. Yeah, that'd, be, that'd be really useful. That'd be great. Okay. So, um, uh, John Costa keeps talking about uh, business metrics. Uh, and that's a uh, critical point. Um, how do we uh, connect this resource with business metrics? Um, so what we're doing, uh, because so there's a slide that I showed, I stopped sharing my screen now, but um, we have business metrics coming out of the data warehouse, basically. Um, mm-hmm. And so there's a point where the, the GraphQL um, connects to Boomi um, in our architecture. And we, we've yet to do that piece of work. So we're just starting to talk to the data warehouse people about how that, how that essentially constructs itself. But I mean, it doesn't make sense, for example, for our data warehouse to have all the XAPI statements we generate. Like I, you know, they might want to have them. I'm not sure if they do or not, but um, that's a huge, huge amount of stuff that basically would be just, you know, filling up the warehouse for no real gain. Um, so the, the approach I'm sort of starting to champion here would be that we um, extract sort of, relevant so educationally relevant things from the activity traces so sort of um, pull out educational constructs or you know activity patterns that we think are useful and we send those kind of aggregated things off to the data warehouse Mm -hmm. and that then gets used in um, business metrics Um, but yeah I I wouldn't really be favoring doing that in XAPI because it's sort of just the wrong level of data granularity, I think. Um, but I think other businesses might choose to go other ways. I see. Yeah, that's kind of the thing we were finding. That, you know, certain data doesn't belong in XAPI, vice versa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, definitely. And I think that that's one of the potential places where XAPI as a community can go very wrong. If people start just putting everything into XAPI, it very quickly becomes kind of nonsensical as a standard. Yeah. Um, so it would be good to um, sort of tease that out a little bit more anyway. Well, thank you so much for getting up so early and giving a great presentation. Uh, I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's excellent work, Kirstie. This is great. Yeah, it's really cool. Hope we can work something out to um, continue the um, collaboration and discussion. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to have discussions just um, with other people, like, you know, with people when they want to, um, even if you can't find a time that works. Um, you know, I'm, I'm normally around. <laughs>